walking in the spirit. Walking in the spirit. If you'll stand with me, we'll turn to Romans chapter 8. We'll be reading verses 1 through 4. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Paul tells us here, therefore, excuse me, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Father, we'll ask you to do what only you can do, and we pray your Holy Spirit will touch our hearts and lives here today. Father, we pray that you're glorified in everything that's said. God, I pray for the anointing of your Spirit. Father, within me, I can do nothing. But Lord, I pray you'll fill this vessel today with your word. Father, I pray you'll anoint the ears of the hearers. Lord, may you speak to them in their heart, Lord, through your spirit. And Lord, give them grace, God, for whatever it is they need. Lord, we pray that you'll carry forth. And, and Lord, that this word would not, go, would not go forth and not do its work. God, we pray that every heart will be prepared to listen. And Father, may you be glorified in all that we do. And all that's accomplished here today, we'll give you praise. We'll give you thanks for it. God, because it's your work, we're your people, we're your church. And we honor you and love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And, and you can be seated. What kind of a church is Jesus coming back for? Now, that's, that's kind of a, a question that uh, today... In, in our society and the way it is in America, uh, people have, have, they have come to take the, the very notion of church very, very lightly. They've come to think church can be whatever I want it to be because after all, I am the church. Well, we know that the Spirit of God resides inside the believer, inside. We are the temple of God. But, in order, but, but, but here's what you can't be. You can't be the church individually. You can only be the church as you, are, as you are bound together with other believers. A lot of people try to live for God and like the long ranger. And however they want to do it, they can do it whichever way they want to. They, they, they don't know the scripture. They don't know the spirit of God and the nature of God and what Lord is coming to receive. Now, you'll find, you'll find in, uh, in, Gal in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27... Uh, a beautiful passage where Jesus is describing, uh, or where Paul is describing what, what the church really looks like. And he uses the relationship of a man and a wife to help us understand what that relationship between the church and the Lord Jesus looks like. But we get a, we get a picture here of the type of church he's coming for. He said that he might present it to himself a glorious church. So God is coming to receive a glorious church. Not having spot, nor wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God is not coming to get a church that is not pure. He's not coming to get a church that's not clean. He's coming to get a church that is ready to go to meet Him. One who has yielded their life over to Him completely and is, and is led by the Spirit of God. The church of God is led by the Spirit of God. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And if in your life today you don't know that you're not led by the Spirit of God, you need to check up and see why you don't feel like that you're led by the Spirit of God. A lot of people feel so weak in their Christian experience that they, they just they can't hardly control anything around themselves. They, they just give in to any old thing and they think I can't do this and I can't do that because I'm too weak. Well the fact is we, have, we don't know the scripture and we don't know the truth of God's word. 
My role in this church is to help the church grow up into the head. And as we all grow up into him, into the unity, I promise you one thing, a church that has Jesus Christ at the center and we're all honoring and adoring the head and we're worshiping Jesus. We come here together corporately worshiping, lifting up Jesus. It'll be a glorious church. And God will do that through the church that he wants to do because we are the body of Christ. You need to see and understand you are a part of the body of Christ and God wants to work his life in you and through you. It's not just long rangers out there doing whatever you want to do. No, it is God working his life in you and working his life through you. Paul said Romans chapter 1 verse 16. He said that the gospel was the power of God unto salvation. He said, I'm not ashamed of it. I hope you're not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, bringing deliverance. That word salvation is deliverance. It means I've been delivered from the old me. I've been delivered from my, from my rebellion against God. Now I'm in union with Jesus Christ and he is, his life fills my life. It's the Holy Ghost of God that has indwelled me and now I'm alive in him. As we consider, we know that there's four aspects of, of salvation that we need to understand. We need to understand that there is regeneration that God did the very moment you received Christ Jesus as Savior. He regenerated your old spirit, your old life, and made you alive under Jesus Christ. And you was instantly justified before God. That means when Jesus' blood was applied to you, God saw you as just, as if you had never sinned in your entire life. A lot of people can't get over their past sin. Sometimes it takes people years to lay down what's happened in the past. If Jesus' blood cleansed your sins, your sins are cleansed and they are gone. You just need to understand that. Amen. And then there's sanctification. Now sanctification is where we're set apart for God. And then there's glorification. Now you'll experience glorification one day. We get little tidbits of it as we're going through life. But the glorification one day is when you close your eyes on death and the Holy Ghost of God sweeps you out of this place into the portals of glory. Then you're going to be glorified. You're going to have a new body like Jesus has. And you talk about glorification, you're going to understand glorification a whole lot better then than you do now. But now when it comes to sanctification, a lot of people just don't understand much about that. That means, that, that means you're set apart. That means you're, you're, you're like a called out one. You're, you're different from everybody else. I want to put you on notice. If you're a child of God, you're different from the world. You don't act like the world. You don't think like the world. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. And if in your heart and mind you don't see yourself like that, I'm going to challenge you this morning. You need to do something about that. You need to make up your mind that I'm going home with Jesus. I'm not going to follow the world and the ways of the world. I'm going to go with Jesus. Now Paul lays out in chapter 6 through chapter 8 everything we need to know when it comes to living this life before Jesus so that we can be ready when he calls his church home that we'll be part of the ones that gets called out. It, it, it amazed you if the rapture took place, how many people would be left sitting in the church pews? I don't know that number, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't point to no one and say, you know, you're going to be left to your No, that's not my job. The Holy Spirit knows. Jesus said, I know those that are mine. But I promise you there'll be churches where people will be sitting in the pews if the rapture was to take place. Why? Because they fail to put their trust in Jesus Christ and let Jesus be their life. A lot of people get saved and begin to try to act like God. That's wrong. That's just wrong. You can't imitate God. You, you, you have to let him live his life in you. And you, 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 have to let that, you have to let that come through and see it in the word of God. You'll find out how many times that Paul uses the term in Christ. And first thing you begin to say and realize, you know what? I need him in me. I can do nothing of myself. I need Jesus Christ in me. I don't need to be walking along beside him. And we, we use those terms a whole lot. And I realize a lot of these terms are just terms that we associate in our mind with. But we have to have the spirit of God living inside of us living inside of us. But after all, it is the Spirit of God that's going to snatch us out of this world. And it's not going to be, he's not going to snatch out somebody who is, is, is living the way they want to live instead of living the way God wants them to live. Christianity is living like God wants us to live. And Paul has laid out this plan right here. And I want to show you clearly if I can, this plan. It's a four-step plan. There's a knowing 
And then there's the reckoning. And there's the yielding. And then there's the walking in the spirit. Now, as we consider chapter 6 of Romans, we'll find out that he shows us that our old man died. In Romans chapter 6, verse 6, he says, knowing this, that our old man has been crucified with Christ. So there's the knowing. If I am going to be successful and live this life that Jesus tells us to live, I'm going to have to realize that my old man, that old Adam, that old Adam nature, that thing that we have so much trouble with, was nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago when Jesus died. And if you've never seen yourself nailed to the cross, you need to see yourself nailed to the cross. You need to realize that that old man, that old nature in you, that old thing that tries to rise up, that was crucified 2,000 years ago. When Jesus died, you died. That's a no, you need to know that. You need to know that for sure. And then you'll find in verse 11 of chapter 6, you'll find that he says to reckon, to reckon it so. In other words, that word reckon is like the word that's used in accounting. Put it on your account because it's a fact. Paul says that you died when Christ died is a fact. And so you need to account it that way. You need to put it, on your, put it on your account that yes, when Jesus died, I died with him. And so therefore my old man is dead. Now the reason why the old man gets up so much in a lot of us is because we've never accounted him as dead. Whenever he begins to stir, we see him as just, it's well, it's my old flesh. And I understand all about the flesh. We have a problem with the flesh. And you will have problems with the flesh all of your life, as long as you're here. But here's what you need to, Paul said, to account it so. Account it that it's dead. And now when you agree with God about something, the first thing you know, you begin to realize that, yes, God gives you power and gives you strength. And you don't have to obey walking in the flesh the way that people wants to walk in the flesh. So many people are trapped in bondage and in all kinds of chains of sin and all that because they will not adhere to the word of God the way he said that is. And he says, he says also in verse 13 that we're to present ourselves or to yield your members to God. So, he, so here's, here's the step so far. I have to know that my old man has died, is dead. I can't just read it and Think about it and all, I have to know it for sure. And then I have to reckon it so I have to put it on my account. My old man is dead. Now every time my old man begins to rear up, I tell him he's dead. Every time I feel anger begin to well up in me to cause me to try to do something against the grace of God, I say, oh man, you're dead. You died 2,000 years ago. You rascal, you get back where you belong. Don't you raise up in me because I'm a child of God. I don't belong to you no more. You are dead in my life. You are dead to me. You're out of commission, son. You're in neutral. You can't operate unless I give you the strength and the authority to operate in me. Jesus has ordained it so. He has put that old man out of commission according to what Paul understood and what Paul told us. And he said, we account it so. And then he said, we, we yield neither, in verse 13, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. That's what we always did was yield our members to unrighteousness and to sin. But now we're to yield. That word yield is present. I'm supposed to present myself to God. Lord, here I am for you to use. Here I am for you to, why? As instruments of righteousness now and not unrighteousness. Why? Because I've been born of God's spirit. I'm a new man in Lord Jesus. Now I present myself to God. Like Isaiah. When Isaiah got cleansed in that vision he saw, here I am I, Lord, send me. That's the idea and that's the heart of what a true Christian looks like. Is to do that. And then the, the, fourth, the fourth point that Paul makes we find in chapter 8. Verse 1. Now you'll notice that you never find mention of the Spirit of God in chapter 6 or chapter 7. <laughs> chapter 7 shows a struggle between the flesh and God. A lot of people use chapter 7 to justify their sin. Said what I would do I don't and what I'm supposed to do I don't do and all that. Paul was telling you what happens in the flesh. But you're not in the flesh if you're walking in the Spirit. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Thank God, through Jesus Christ, he said. 
Jesus Christ has delivered from that. Now it's time for us to walk in it. So now we come to walking in the spirit. And I want to give us this morning, I want to give us motivation for walking in the spirit. And then I want to show you some practical ways that we are, that we can walk in the spirit. I've always wondered just how walking in the spirit, that sounded mystical and all that. How do I do that? How do I do that in the practical? What does that look like in my everyday life? How do I do that? I, I sincerely believe you walk in the spirit when you're in Walmart. You walk in the spirit when you're at home, working around the house, when you're cooking on the stove. Well, you can walk in the spirit always. You don't have to walk any other way except walk in the spirit. And you say, well, how do you do that? That's what I want to show us this morning. I want to show us how to do that. But now the motivation, well, what motivation is there for me to walk in the spirit? Here's what motivates me. Look at verse 1 in chapter 8. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Now, if you don't want condemnation, where are you going to be? You're going to be walking in the Spirit. And if you're not walking in the Spirit, then there's condemnation. Now, you can get some idea of, of, the, of, 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 the, of the condemnation uh, by thinking about what, what Jesus said verily verily I say unto you except a man be born again he cannot enter the kingdom of God the, the born again experience must take place Galatians 5.16 says this Paul says this I say then walk in the spirit notice that walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now the word walk is this. The word walk has got several meanings. You can literally, it means to move around. It, goes, it means go all about. And basically what it means, your entire lifestyle, everything you do your whole life, all this is what we mean by walk. When we walk in the spirit. Now I know that if I ask you personally, how often do you walk in the spirit? Some of you are going to have a hard time answering that question because you realize and know that I don't feel like I'm walking in the Spirit very much and very often. Now, what you're saying is, I don't feel exuberated very much. I don't feel excited very much. I don't feel emotional very much. But what we're talking about is a practical term of walking in the Spirit. Am I living according to what God's Word has said for me to do? Am I living according to what the Bible has instructed me to do? Is that my normal life? Is that the way I live? What walking in the Spirit, that's what walking in the Spirit is. Now, if I'm walking in the Spirit, here's two things that's going to happen. There's going to be no condemnation and I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And in Galatians chapter 5, Paul shows us what the works of the flesh looks like. All those things, lying and all that, every bit of that. He shows us what the works of the flesh looks like. And if you will look at those things carefully, you'll recognize that while you're walking in the flesh, you do some of those things. The anger, the envy, the jealousy, all that kind of stuff shows up in you when you're walking in the flesh. When you're walking in the spirit, it is not so. You walk according to the way God shows you. Why? Because you've allowed Jesus through the Holy Spirit to have your life. And now your life, you have presented yourself to God. Now you are a living example of what Jesus Christ looks like in his church and in his people. I'm telling you, he's coming for a people who has without spot or without wrinkle is the church he's coming for. Don't let yourself be deceived and think I can just do any way I want to and I can go to heaven when I die. You may find out that you never really understood. You never really was born of God's spirit. You had some kind of religious experience, but it was not the spirit of the living God because your life, it don't exemplify what the true Christian looks like. You have to be very, very careful because there's so much deception out there. We was warned over and over in the scripture, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that you're going to reap. We have to understand, I need to know how to walk in the spirit. Now, practically, how do we do that? Well, in John 3, 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So basically what Jesus said, you got to be changed on the inside. You can't just turn over a new leaf. You can't just start acting some way out. You got to be changed on the inside. You have to be born from above. You have, God is committing his life to you through the person of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 2.14 and I wish I had time to go there and quite a bit of information right there. We'd preach a whole series of messages on several verses right there that Paul reveals in, in 1 Corinthians he, but he said, the natural man don't receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, a lot of people, you hear them re re repeat the phrase, eyes not seen, ears not heard, the things God has in store. But if you'll read just a few verses prior to this verse I just read to you, you'll find out that Paul says, but now they have been revealed to us through the Spirit. God has revealed the deep things of God. Here's what God has revealed. He has revealed Jesus Christ. He has revealed the plan of salvation. He has revealed that I come to save you. I paid your sin debt. Now you give me your life. You turn yourself over to me and I will make you a child of the living God. Amen. You no longer will belong to this earth. You won't belong to the world system. You belong to God. That's what's been revealed. And that's, that's the secret that's been hid from ages. The Old Testament had all kinds of examples of the bloodshed and all that. All that was pointing toward for the precious blood of Jesus was shed to pay the sin debt of the world. And now that sin debt has been paid. And now Jesus saying, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. But you've got to watch out for humans. I'm going to tell you, humans or something else. There's so much deception out there. They'll try to get you to do anything except give yourself to God. They'll, they'll try to get you to walk all kinds of ways. Do you know most people when they, when they come to know the Lord, first thing they begin to think about, now what can I do for the Lord? What can I do for Jesus? What can I do? I need to do something. Let me do something. That's not what God's interested in you. God's more interested in you being something. God's more interested in you being his child. If you'll be his child, he'll do through you what he wants to do. Well, glory. I, I can't do what I want to do no more. Why? Because I belong to God. I can't do it my way no more. Why? I belong to God. I've got to do what God tells me to do because I'm clean and free. Born by the Spirit from above. Going home to Jesus whenever soon as God calls me home. On my way to glory to serve Him through all the endless age of eternity. Don't know what He's going to do with me. Don't know why He wanted me. But I know according to the Holy Word of God, He is mine and I'm His. And nothing can change that. There's nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate So why would we not give ourselves totally to God? The reason why is because the devil don't want you to. The old flesh is pulling on you. The old flesh is trying to hold you down. He's, he's keeping you from getting the best God has for you. The best place you'll be in God is when you're yielding to him and you're willing to do whatever he asks you to do. You're not ready to pick your place. A lot of people pick where they want to go. I believe I'll go over here a while. They got good music over there. And a lot of stuff's going on in the church world today. People just floating around trying to find what they want. It ain't about God. It ain't about the glory of Jesus. It's about what they want. It's flesh. It may be the good flesh in man, but it's flesh. I'm telling you, God will plant you in a church where you'll serve in that church the way God wants you to serve. You won't be floating around just looking for any old thing, what appeases you and what makes you happy. You'll be looking for somewhere where the man of God will preach the word of God to you and help you come to know what the word of God means and what it's like. Listen, he's coming after a church spotless. The only way I could be spotless is to get into the book, get into Jesus. The only way I could be spotless is walk in the spirit. Are you with me? Are you following where I'm at? All right, let's walk in the Spirit. How am I going to do that? I must receive the Spirit. In other words, I've got to be born again. I can't go through some religious mode of God bears witness of my spirit that I am the child of God. I, I saw that one day and I got a hold of that. I, I, like, I like to shout it all over the place. I understood 
God's spirit has more witness with my spirit than I'm his son. <laughs> I've never got over that. Nobody can take that away from me. You know why? Because it was a revelation from heaven, from God. God said, you are my son. I said, glory to God. I don't know how you did it, but thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because I had a pretty long rap sheet when it comes to sin. I don't know about you, but my rap sheet was pretty long when it comes to sin. But you know what? The Lord, through the blood of Christ, forgave every sin. He sees me white as snow. If you're born of God's spirit, he sees you white as snow. The devil don't want you to know that. The devil don't want you to understand that. The flesh don't want you to know that. How am I going to walk in the spirit? I must grow. I must grow in faith. My, my faith has got to grow. How am I going to do that? Romans 10, 17. Romans 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know why some people's faith don't grow? They never take in the word of God. They never open their Bible. They don't have a time when they, when they get along with Jesus. They don't get a time whenever they, they, they want him more than they want anything. They're too busy doing everything. The devil wants you to do everything beside read the Bible. I love to fish. I don't know what rather read my Bible I'd have had to fish though. I, honestly, I had. I, get, I don't catch many fish when I go. Now my brother catches fish. I, I don't. I don't get that many. But I know what brother reading the Bible. I had to go fish. You know why? Because there's more in the Bible than there is in the lake. That passes away. This eternal word don't pass away. The word of God feeds. But anyway, see, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. Now that hearing is the word rhema. The Greek word rhema is what that, in, in, you, interpret, you look at the, in the original Greek, that's, that means that God himself has spoken into your heart. Logos is when you read the Bible. But whenever, whenever, whenever that word jumps off of the page and gets into your heart and does something in your heart, you wow, that's, that's rhema. That's God has spoken to me. And I'm so glad that we have the opportunity. But see, we'll never grow in faith if we're not reading the Bible. If we're not under preaching, sound solid preaching, you'll never grow. Listen, you need to feed your soul so that you can grow. So you see, growing, I'll never walk in the spirit on a continual basis if I'm not willing to grow. We've already touched on this. You've got to know that your old man's dead. Oh, he'll raise up once in a while, but remind him he's dead. Just say, old man, Brother Bill down at Bitmore Baptist told me you was dead, so you die. You, you, you get where you belong. I wish I could help you see yourself on the cross of Calvary. God will give you that revelation one day if you'll seek him and you'll ask him. He'll show you that. You got to present yourself to God. You got, you got, you got to read God's word. I love Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How can I walk in the spirit if I'm not in the word of God? I, I would recommend this. Set aside a time daily when you spend time in God's Word. It may not be a great deal of time. I don't read the Bible just trying to read it to be reading it. Oh, I read four chapters today. What do you remember? Well, nothing. You didn't do you good. You just might well have done something else. You might well do something else. No, read it and let it speak to you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him might have eternal life. That word may cause you to invite your neighbor to come to know Jesus. When I realized, hey, that's free. He died for the world. You see, we're going to have to be in his word. I would also say, walking in the spirit, you're going to have to resist the devil because he's going to come at you. You're going to have to fight him a whole lot. Listen to these passages. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. He, Peter says, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, he's your enemy, by the way. 
as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Notice verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. James says it this way in chapter 4, verse 7 in James. Submit yourselves therefore to God. In other words, give yourself to God. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. If you're going to walk in the spirit, there's going to be some submitting to God and there's going to be some resisting the devil. I have confessed to you several times and I'll do it again today. There's been times when I've come right here at this altar, bowed down to pray and evil thoughts come to my mind. Words that I used to use back when I wasn't saved would flash in there, old cuss words and all that kind of stuff. That was nothing but demonic pressure coming to me and you resist it. It's, it happens in everybody. I guarantee you, every one of you, if you, when you've got down to pray, there's been bad, nasty thoughts or evil thoughts or hatred thoughts or something like that come to your brain and you've had to resist it. Why? Because the devil don't want you in a place of freedom in God. He don't want you there. We must pray. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Before he said that, he said, rejoice evermore. How can I rejoice? All I have to do to rejoice is think about what Jesus done for me. He saved my soul. So now I can rejoice. Pray without ceasing. What does that mean? I cannot go around like that. I walk into something and bump my head if I do. I fall off an edge somewhere. But pray without ceasing is an attitude toward God. But I want to encourage you in something. My prayer is that you have a personal time that you steal away somewhere and you commune with God. You still away, Father, which you are in heaven. Hallowed. That word hallowed is about as high as you can get other than hallelujah. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. That's some of the sweetest time whenever you work out and develop that time along with God. You don't have to make a big hoopla about it. But what you do, you're just in communion with God. You, you're knowing for sure that God is feeding your soul. Don't starve yourself. If you really want to walk in the spirit, I would suggest that you do these things that we mentioned. You have to know that you're saved. You have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. I know that I know that I know. I can't walk in the spirit if I ask people sometimes, you going to heaven when you die? I hope so. Breaks my heart. Because I know that they've understood that Jesus died for their sins. And they're hoping somehow that they'll get their sins paid for. What that tells me is they don't know the Word of God. They've never understood the depth of God's Word. And they need to really realize that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they've been saved. And then it, we got to grow. We got to grow. No one, uh, the, last thing, uh, the last thing the Apostle Peter tells us in, in, in 2 Peter, uh, right at the very end of the epistle, he wrote, But grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. But grow. He has commanded the church, all of us, to grow. I should be growing constantly. Growing how? Growing up into him, into the head. In conclusion, what kind of church is the Lord returning to receive? He's receiving a church without spot or blemish. He's receiving a glorious church. He says it should be holy and without blemish. I want to ask you a very important question. Does that reflect your life?
a glorious church, not having spot, no wrinkle, or any such thing. 